Hi, everybody. My name, um, my pleasure, my pleasure, my honor to introduce my good friend and a mentor, Frank Alaco. My name is Ann Strickers, and I, I teach a class called Sports and Spirituality. Um, I've taught that since two, 2010, and it's an elective theology course for seniors. Um, honestly, the highlight of my year, of that year, is every spring, um, Frank comes and speaks in my classroom. Um, so I know what you're in for with this session. Um, just a little bit of information on why he might come to a class. First of all, I just think that's awesome that somebody like Frank would make the time to speak with high school students that he may or may not know. It says a lot about him. Uh, I have an older brother, and growing up, he always went to Excel basketball camp. Uh, this is a camp that Frank started in uh, the Bay Area. I think it's also in New Jersey. Uh, one of the things that you should know about it, it's very affordable for families. Um, it emphasizes the fundamentals, um, and it is very personal. So my brother absolutely loved it. And just to show you how personal it was, Frank called my home, and my dad loved this camp, not only because of all that, but because when the, uh, the person who started the camp called the house, he said, Frank Alaco, I know that name. Well, he would know that as a Notre Dame fan because Frank was the quarterback um, here for the Fighting Irish. Um, my students love it for the life lessons and the stories, so much so that this spring, one of my students said, I would, he made me want to run through a brick wall for him. I just thought that was the ultimate compliment. Um, I'm always like, you guys have no idea what he's not telling you. He emphasizes, again, stories and life lessons. Um, but what he's not going to tell you, he probably won't tell you in this talk, so I'm going to tell you. Uh, Frank has three state championships in California for coaching boys basketball at the high school level. California is a huge state. That's incredibly um, impressive. He um, coached the McDonald's All-American uh, team. He was coach of the year. He's coached at every level, CYO, um, high school, and then at the University of San Francisco. Frank is a husband, a father, and he's also a poet. He writes a poem every Christmas that I really cherish. Um, but I thought really the best thing that he is, among many things, um, and he's also a devout Christian, um, and he always ties that, his faith, to story. So I thought I could conclude with a story. This is a quote by Barry Lopez. He says, if stories come to you, care for them and learn to give them away where they are needed. Sometimes a person needs a story more than food to stay alive. So I find myself and my students very nourished by the stories that Frank tells us. So how appropriate that we just had lunch, we're nourished, and we will continue to feast. Thank you. Frank? Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Good. Sound good? Okay. Well, there's two things that stand out looking at that picture. Number one, why isn't 72 blocking? I'm about to get killed. <laughs> and secondly, um, Bill Cartwright, you know, legendary basketball player at USF, NBA. He's a good friend of mine. We work uh, side by side at USF. And um, one day I showed him a YouTube video of me working out with Joe Namath. And... Um, I didn't tell Bill, I had hair, as you can see. I used to have hair, so I had all this hair, and I'm working out with Joe Namath side by side, and I said to Bill, you know who that is? He said, well, that's Joe Namath. He said, I think that's Jim Zorn. And I said, no, it's not Jim Zorn. He goes, is, is it Joe Theismann, right? And so uh, I said, no, it's not Joe Theismann either, who was my hero growing up. And I, in, the, in the video, I take my jacket off, and I have a tank top on, right? And I'm throwing, and he goes, I don't know who that is. I go, that's me. He goes, man, you were a stud. He goes, what happened? Did you get sick or something? <laughs> so he humbled me very well. But yeah, I used to, used to be uh, okay. But it's really a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be back at Notre Dame. I love Notre Dame. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I was talking to Molly about this the other day, that it's the kind of place that grows on you. you know, after you leave, it's like a wine. It ferments. It even gets a little better than it was. And I'm um, happy to be a part of this conference. I first heard of this conference through my participation in the Sport at the Service of Humanity conference. I know some of you might have gone to that. But that conference uh, is an initiative developed by Pope Francis, who sees sports as a way to unite people. Um, it consists of six principles, joy, compassion, respect, enlightenment, love, and balance. And I'm going to touch on many of these principles, as have many of the outstanding speakers that we've heard at this conference. The story I'm going to share with you today is not one of an athlete fulfilling his dreams. It's my story of gaining the real value in the proper perspective of sports. 
When I was a young boy growing up in New Jersey, my dream was to play football at Notre Dame, to be the starting quarterback at Notre Dame. I was talking to some of the participants here, and we were some of the guys who were my, old, my age. On Sundays, they used to have an 11 o'clock show, which was the Notre Dame Highlights. Back then, there wasn't many games on television, maybe one a week, but the highlights, Notre Dame had that on every Sunday at 11. And I used to sit there and watch Terry Hanratty and Jim Seymour and dream about the time that I'm going to do this. I'm going to play football at Notre Dame, and I'm going to get on that show. I attended Catholic school in, in Our Lady of Peace uh, School in New Providence, New Jersey. And each day, I would look forward to recess. And we always played touch football. And, and back then, some of you could relate to this if you're older than 60 here, the boys played on one side and the girls played on the other side. Well, I always made sure we played right in the middle so the girls could watch me play. And, and I remember after one of the touch football games, I ran over to Sister Loyola, the the eighth grade teacher, and I said, Sister, do you follow Notre Dame football? And she said, I do. I said, well, you keep following them because one day I'm going to be their starting quarterback. So I went across the, after graduation, I walked across the field over to New Providence High School. And my brothers had gone to Catholic school, but I wanted to go to public school because they didn't have football at the Catholic school. So I walked over and I met the football coach, Mr. Carpenter, and uh, I went over to him and I said, Coach, you've got to give me every drill you can give me to get me to Notre Dame. I want to be the starting quarterback at Notre Dame. He looked at me and he said, Notre Dame, you're never going to play here. He said, you're, you're five foot nine, you're 130 pounds, you got an all-American quarterback ahead of you. I said, don't, don't worry about that, just, just help me. And he did. He would stay after practice with me. Notre Dame ran the wing tee and I, was, I would do the footwork drills with him all the time. And he, he, he was just a great mentor in my life. And he really did give me, after practice, regular practice would end, he and I would stay outside, and we'd work on throwing on the run or doing other things that Notre Dame was doing that time. Well, the quarterback ahead of me, Bob Woodruff, was an outstanding quarterback. He's an All-American. He went to Syracuse to play, and that was my turn. I was a junior, and I had a great year, and I broke most of his records. Uh, our team got really good at the end of the year. We won five of our last six games. We go into our senior year, and everything's rolling. I get named to the kickoff All-American team. So I'm one of the top 100 backs in the country, and I'm getting recruited by everybody, including Notre Dame. I can still see those letters when they came in. I would uh, take them, show my dad, and I can still see the letterhead like it was yesterday. And everything was going great. We had 19 starters back from the year before. Uh, we had two preseason scrimmages. We beat uh, Union. I think it was 55 to 10. They went on to win the state championship that year. We beat Randolph 45 to 14. In one of the games, I threw for over 300 yards. The other scrimmage, I ran for over 150 yards. So I had the running end of it. I had the passing end of it. Everything was going great. And then the first game came. We're playing Springfield High School. There were 9,000 people at that game to watch us. You know, the aerial circus set to roll. I had all my receivers back. And the first time we got the ball, we went right down the field. I remember we had a third down and long, and everybody's expecting a pass play. I called a draw play, and my little brother ran like 60 yards. And I remember skipping down the field thinking, this is going to be a magical year, the greatest year of my life. Two plays later, we're in the end zone, my first series in high school, senior year. I'm two for two, one touchdown pass. We get the ball back. Next time, we're running the option. I came down the line. I remember faking the pitch. And I put down my shoulder, ran into a defensive back. I had now grown to 165 pounds. And uh, I ran in, I shot my forearm at this guy, and I snapped my collarbone in half. So now I'm laying on the field. I know something's wrong. I can feel my bone sticking out. And I'm trying to push it back in. And the, 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 the second string quarterback comes in. I said, no, I can play. I'm going to play with this, right? And I walked off the field. I laid down on the on the table and my high school coach came over and started crying and I knew that was it. And it was an awful feeling. I knew that everything I had worked for was over. And I remember walking off the field, my father came out and it took me to the hospital and I got there and I was so distraught that my dream had been shattered. I wasn't going to Notre Dame. I'm sitting in the waiting room and my father and my brother Jerry were there and they were so kind. They were just you know, talking to me that it's okay. It's God's way of telling you you're a basketball player. <laughs> and, and so, you know, they said, you just got to heal, get ready for basketball, and you'll have a great year. I was being, I was more recruited for basketball than I was for football. 
So that made some sense to me. And about you know two hours later, I'm leaving the hospital and I'm, I'm putting football behind me. I'm going to play basketball, and that's that. And um, I had been recruited by Duke, by Maryland, by Princeton, so I had some good options, right? So I'm driving home in the car, not crying anymore. I turn on the radio, and there's a Notre Dame fight song. And I start crying all over again. And I went back that night. My teammates came to see me. I put on a good face that I was going to be back, which I knew I wasn't coming back. And then I remember this nun came to see me. Um, and she, she gave me a poem. And I, I, I still look at it to this day. It said, each sorrow is a shadow sweet that tells how near Christ's nailed feet are walking by thy side. And I put that over my bed. And in that, in that time, it really helped get me through, you know, an awful time that I just kept thinking of the pain that Christ might have felt. And here my life was shattered and certainly not re relative to it, what Christ went through, but it was, it was painful and it helped me get through it. I didn't return to football that year. I had a great year. I averaged 29 points a game in basketball. And again, I was being recruited by all these big schools. And my high school coach would not go away. He kept writing to Notre Dame and telling them that you have to recruit this kid. And they were saying, you know, we've never recruited a kid who didn't play their senior year. Everybody who recruited me for football basically told me that. You know, you didn't play your senior year, we can't recruit you. But Notre Dame kind of hung around a little bit because of him. He kept calling them, he kept bugging them, writing them letters. He's, last year I was there and he showed me two of the letters that he wrote uh, to them. It was pretty impressive. Well, Joe Yanto, the line coach from here, came out to watch me play basketball. Had a really good game and after the game, he talked to me a little bit. He said, we'd love to have you come out for an official visit to Notre Dame. And I'm thinking, I'm not playing football anymore. This is crazy. You know, I'm playing basketball. I'm done. But I was torn because I had been telling everybody since the time I was a little kid that I was going to Notre Dame. And I didn't want to disappoint my mother, didn't want to disappoint my father, my coaches and everything. So I thought, okay, I'll take this visit to Notre Dame. So I came out here on my visit, and I was telling somebody earlier, Notre Dame's a crazy place. You know, I got all four seasons in one day. You know, I pulled in on the plane. It was pouring rain. They drove me out to the practice field. And I see Ara Parsegan, who I thought was God then, and I still think that today, pretty amazing man. And I got to meet Ara. And Ara said to me, I want you to kneel down in the huddle and imagine you're the Notre Dame quarterback. I was a little reluctant to do that because I had on this brown polyester leisure suit that was pretty sweet, <laughs> big silk shirt, big collar out to here. And I'm thinking, I don't want to get muddy, but, but being a good kid, listening to my coach, I knelt in that huddle and I made believe I was the quarterback. And they said, now stand next to me and make believe you're in the pocket at Notre Dame. It was right on the field back there at Cartier Field. They snapped the ball and these guys came running at me in the mud and I swear I almost passed out. And I said, I can't do this. There's no way I can play football here. So I made some excuse. I went up to Joe Yanto, the coach, and I said, Coach, I don't feel really good. I just got off the plane. You know, I, I need to go lay down a little bit. So I went back to the Mars Inn over by the dome, and I went back to my room, and I laid in the bed, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And I said, how am I going to get out of this? You know, I said, can't disappoint people. That night, I went to a party. Didn't enjoy the party very much. I only stayed about 15 minutes, and I told my host, I said, I'm just going to take a walk. So I started walking around the campus, and now it started to snow. And, and I'm just getting lost, and I, I remember walking by the, the Twin Lakes, and I was totally lost, had no idea where I was, but this campus was starting to look beautiful. It was covered in white. The snowflakes were falling down. In the distance, I see thousands of candles lit, and I see the grotto. So I go over to the grotto, and I kneel down, and I started to pray. And I said, dear God, you have to help me. You've got to find a way to get me out of this. You know, whether they don't offer me a scholarship, or we've got to find a way. I don't want to play football. And I, 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 this, is not, this isn't for me. And I prayed about an hour or so. And I went back to my room that night. And the next morning, I went to see Coach Parsegan in his office. And he said, you know, you, re you remind us a lot of Joe Theismann. You know, he said, you're from New Jersey, you look like him, you talk like him, you're the same size. Um, it's funny, he told me that when he recruited me, and all of you guys would know that after you're there, they treat you a little differently. So when he was recruiting me, I was Joe Theismann, running, throwing. <laughs> but one day around the field, and he said to me, Alaco, it's uncanny how much you look like Joe Theismann. 
He said, you know, you look like him, you talk like him, you walk like him, but you throw like Zenon Bidzinski. <laughs> I said, who's he? He said, he's a school photographer. <laughs> but I was sure Joe Theismann when he was recruiting me, and, and he said to me, I'm going to offer you a full scholarship. And he said, I want you to take it home and talk to your mom and dad. And I said, no, that's not necessary. I'm coming. And I don't know what happened that night, but it was almost like divine intervention, like was somebody telling me that this is where I had to be. This is where I needed to be and where I should be. And it was a great decision to come here. Although when I got here, I was a ninth spring quarterback because I hadn't played my senior year. I had no film, so I was the lowest quarterback there. And I remember calling my dad and saying, Dad, you know, I'm the ninth spring quarterback. I'm the second team safety, and I've never played defense in my life. I said, I'm not playing defense. I'm a quarterback. And my father used to just say, just keep working hard. Just keep doing what you do, and let me know when you're a Notre Dame man. And so I took his advice, and I just kept working hard. I worked my way up to uh, be a second-string quarterback. In my sophomore year, we played in the Orange Bowl against Nebraska. They had a fantastic team. Johnny Rogers, David Hum, one of the greatest teams I've ever seen. They beat us 40-6. to six. It was the worst loss in Notre Dame history up to that point. It was an awful loss. And I remember Arrow walking into the locker room, and he said, gentlemen, remember this as long as you live. Adversity has the effect of eliciting talents which under prosperous conditions might have remained dormant. And he walked out of the room. I remember thinking how happy I was that I was a quarterback because I actually knew what all those big words meant. So he called the alignment over and explained to them, no offense to any of you linemen out there. But that became our battle cry. Adversity has the effect of eliciting talents which under prosperous conditions might have remained dormant. And that fall and the spring, we worked so hard together. And we learned how to respect our roles on the team. And we learned how to play for each other. And, and everyone elevated their game. And we went from an 8-3 and three season to an 11-0 season. We beat Alabama in the national championship game. Thank you. So everything's going well. I'm getting a lot of playing time. I'm still the backup to a great quarterback by the name of Tommy Clements. And um, enjoying it here. I'm the holder, you know, so I'm getting to play a bit, and I'm getting to play in a lot of the games. In the middle of my senior year, Coach Parsegian, I'm on the bus, and he calls me off the bus. And he said to me, we want to appeal for you to get an extra year of eligibility. And I said, can we do that? I played, you know, in a game my sophomore year, one or two games. And um, he said, you know, you had your problems with your pinkies. I have this pinky that doesn't work, and they fixed this one. I never got this one fixed. But we applied for an extra year of eligibility, and I got it. So now I'm going to be the starting quarterback at Notre Dame. And I was so excited that I would sometimes drive home in my car and just honk the horn. I was so happy. You know, I'm finally going to do this, and I'm here with Ara, you know, who I dearly love. And then Coach announced that he was leaving. He was going uh, to leave that year, and I'm thinking, now what do I do? And he said, you're going to be fine. He says, I'm going to showcase you at the bowl game. He saw that game against Alabama. He made sure I played in that game, and he did everything he could, could to showcase me. So now we're in the winter workouts. Everything is going great. Uh, I'm really excited that I'm getting my opportunity. Our team looks really good. And I decide I'm going to go to Mass every day. I used to do that when I was a kid. I was a daily communicant all through elementary school. Um, and then I said, I'm going to go to Mass every day just to thank God for giving me the opportunity uh, to, to play quarterback here. And so I went to church every day. And I met this old man one day. It's towards the end of Mass. This guy walks in right around the communion. He was about 85 years old. And he was so cold, he was shivering, and his, his face was actually frozen with tears. And I couldn't wait to see him. He reminded me a lot of my grandfather. So when Mass ended, I walked up to him, and I introduced myself. And he told me his name was Harry Davis. He said he was, uh, he said he was uh, actually he told me he was Jefferson Davis first, which he was the president of the Confederacy. Um, but he, later he admitted to me that his name was Harry, Harry Davis. He was 85 years old. And he used to go to church every day as well. And we got to be friends. We would sit together. And then one day I said, why don't I pick you up on the way to Mass every day? Because the reason he was so cold is he used to ride his bike to Mass every day. And it was on Highway 31 over here behind the school. And when it snowed, obviously, it would take him time. He'd fall off his bike and whatnot. 
And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll just pick you up every day. So I picked him up every morning. We went to church together. One day I said, Harry, what do you do after Mass? He said, I go visit my wife. And I said, where's your wife? He said, she's at Highland Cemetery. And I said, well, how do you do that? He goes, well, I ride my bike there. And I said, how long does that take you? He said, about five hours. I said, five hours? That's like 15 minutes away. He said, well, I ride my bike. And I ride along the highway, and sometimes the trucks go by, and they splash snow on me, and I got a fall down pickup. I said, I'll tell you what, I don't have class till late because I was a fifth-year person. I said, I'll take you to the cemetery every day. So we, after Mass, I would take him to the cemetery, and I would sit and watch this guy get out of the car, walk over to his wife's grave. He would kneel. He would wipe off her, wipe off her headstone, and he would sit there quietly and pray. And as we began to trust each other more, he, he started having me go with him. And he would always tell me how we're going to put artificial flowers out here. We're going to really do this up really nice in the spring. It's a great experience just hanging around with him and, and, and learning from him. He was a he, had, uh, he helped build Newt Rockney's house. And the cool thing about it was he didn't know I played football. I never told him that I played. That was kind of cool that, you know, at a time when I was the number one quarterback, I'm giving a football to President Ford here on campus. But yet we had this friendship just based on church, you know, that we had something really special. And a few weeks after that, spring practice came, and um, everything was going well. I remember I threw a touchdown pass to Ken McAfee. I don't know if you ever remember, some of you remember Ken. He played for the 49ers, great player. And Ken was my guy, right? So that was the combination. And everything was perfect. And I'm thinking, this is going to be my senior year in high school. I finally got my chance. So about two weeks later, I was rolling out to my left. And I remember I was coming around to throw a pass here. And a linebacker caught my foot. And I put my arm down to get my balance. And a defensive end fell on top of my shoulder. My right shoulder hit the ground. It was on fire. It got really hot, and I knew I was, it was over. The trainer came out to the field, and I remember looking at him. I just said, all the time I put into this. You know, all the time, and one hit, it was over. And I went back to the, uh, to the training room, and he said, well, you saved us money. We don't even need an X-ray. You know, we've got to fix that. Um, and that night, I was at the hospital, and the new coach, Dan Devine, came over. And Coach Devine, I said, let's be honest, Coach. I'm accepted at law school. You know, I don't need to do this. You know, if I'm not going to play, I'll just graduate. You know, in two weeks, I'll just move on. He said, Frank, there's no way you're not going to play. You know, we have Rick Slager, Gary Forstek. You know, they have no experience. And we've got that, you know, young kid, the skinny kid from Pennsylvania, Joe Montana. He's never going to be anything. You know, so, so, so you have to stay. And I'm thinking about that. Well, well, that makes some sense. You know, we can't have Joe Montana running the team, right? <laughs> I got to come back, right? So for the good of Notre Dame, I decided to stay. And I got on this workout program that was crazy. So back in the day, you know, like you're walking around campus. There's a lot of football players here. You can see them. Right, walking around campus, basketball players. Back in the day, not many people stayed for summer school unless you needed it. You know, you didn't train year-round like that, right? So I decided I was going to stay. And I had this little regiment that I did. I would run down to the uh, Newt Rockney, the Rockney building in the South Quad. Some of us took the tour this morning. That's at the end of that quad. Then I would go in the pool, and I would just do my range of motion exercises, right? Then I would run over to the ACC, um, not called that anymore, but the ACC back then, and I would lift weights a little bit, just real light weight. And then I would go to St. Joseph's Beach, which is a lake over here behind the firehouse, and I would swim in the lake just to get my range of motion for my shoulder. And the last thing I would do is I would run the stadium steps. We all got to visit the stadium last night. And I used to run those steps every day. It was up 56 rows, over one, down 56, over one, up 56. I did it 38 times a day. And I would bring different players with me, and they would get sick to their stomach and never do it again with me, but I did it every day. And I was in the best shape of my life. And I got to the 32nd gate towards the end of August. Spring camp, fall camp was about to start. And I hit the 32nd gate, and for the first time, I was dead tired, and I was going to quit. 
And I said, There's, I, I, can, I can stop. I don't need to do any more. I was so exhausted. I said, that's it. I'm done. And I started to slow down, and I looked over to the entrance of the gate, and I saw this elderly couple bringing their son in, obviously going to his first day at Notre Dame. And I had my jersey on with my name on the back, and, and I thought, these people know I'm the starting quarterback. Well, with that, I put a burst of speed on, and I sprinted those four gates. I had the energy and the adrenaline because they were there. And I ran back over to them, and I uh, welcomed them to Notre Dame. Introduced myself, welcome to Notre Dame. Towards the end of the summer, I was throwing really well, and the season was about to begin. Went to see the doctor for a checkup, and he said, you know, there's this, you have this little notch in your, in your collarbone. And I had seen that on an x-ray about a month earlier. I had a lot of experience with collarbones, and I could see there was a little tiny gray dent in it. And I asked him, I said, don't worry about it. Well, now it was a divot. And they had put a piece of Mersaline tape in to hold my shoulder down. And every time I would throw or do something, it was rotating. It was kind of grinding it. So he said, we have two choices. You can go with it, probably going to snap your collarbone, or we can go in and take the tape out. And so we decided to go in and take the tape out. It was a minor, minor injury, but it set me back about four weeks. And it really, really hurt me, and I wasn't able to come back from it. And I remember Coach Devine called me and he said, you're not going to play in the first two games. We're playing Boston College on a Monday night, playing Purdue on a Saturday. You know, you'll sit out the first two games, then we'll reevaluate you. So I was sitting on the sideline, that national championship, the, the, the opening game, the Boston College game. And I remember crying as they played the Star Spangled Banner, looking through my helmet. And I was questioning why God would do this to me. You know, I had always had such great faith. I had done everything that he had asked of me, and yet every time I got what I wanted, I got cheated out of it. And that was my mentality. And I was really spiraling. You know, it really wasn't a good situation for me. My life was clearly spinning out of balance with this, right? So I didn't get the opportunity to play that year. I never did get reevaluated, and I didn't get to play that year. And it was an awful, awful experience. And I have to tell you, I was telling Molly this when we were walking over the other day, Probably one of my favorite days at Notre Dame was seeing it in the rearview mirror when I drove away in December thinking, I'm glad that's over. It didn't work out for me. It wasn't a great experience for me, and I was just glad to be out of here. And I was very bitter for a long time. And then one day I got a letter from my best friend's mother. And in the letter she said, you know, I just ached for you. From the time I watched you play in high school, she said, we all saw greatness in you. We thought you would be special. And you just never got a break. You know, in high school, you broke your collarbone. Then you go to Notre Dame, and you're the most patient guy. You work hard. You wait for your opportunity. And then your shoulder separates, and you don't get that opportunity to play. And I really thought about that and really forced me to sort of wrestle with my feelings and analyze my experience. And I finally picked up a pen, and I wrote back. And I talked about my injuries, and I said, you know, it was a de devastating injury in high school, but something good really came out of it. The words of Sister John Bertram, each sorrow is a shadow sweet that tells how near Christ nailed feet are walking by thy side. It provided me with a connection to Christ and a connection that I still feel to this day, that when anything goes wrong in my life, I look at it as a blessing that I get to feel a little bit of what he must have felt, you know, with the disappointment of his friend betraying him and turning their back on him and, and being crucified. I told her that I realize now that I had played sports for all the wrong reasons. I lost the joy. And joy is such an important part that we've heard about through sport, the service of humanity, as well as this conference. I wasn't playing for the right reasons. I wanted to be the starting quarterback because I wanted to make my mother and father happy. You know, and I wanted to make my coaches happy and my friends happy. I wanted the fame. I wanted the NFL career. I wanted to please and impress others. And God showed me through my injury that real satisfaction comes from within, not from the adulation of others. I reflected upon the amazing personal and team development that I saw after our Orange Bowl loss, how that team embraced adversity. We learned to respect each other, another key component of sport for the service of humanity. Everyone on that team had a role. And we totally embraced discipline, love, and sacrifice. I went back to my reunion of the national championship team. And they asked someone to speak from each class. 
And three of the four guys they asked to speak were NFL players. And for the junior class, they picked me. And I had 10 seconds to collect my thoughts. And when I got up in front of my teammates and Father Hesburgh and Coach Parsegan, who were there, I said, the fact that you would choose me to speak speaks volumes about who we were. Because I was a holder. I was a backup quarterback. But I was important, and I felt important. They made me feel important. My job was to keep guys loose. I was funny. I did a great Bee Gees imitation in the shower that everybody enjoyed, right? And so I had a role, and I felt important in my role. I never once thought about leaving and going somewhere else. I just felt that I'll make this work, and I'll be the best teammate I can possibly be. So through that experience, I learned the importance of discipline, love, and sacrifice. I think back to my attendance at Mass with Harry Davis. And I think Harry Davis was an angel that was sent to me to teach me what love was. Because I couldn't believe that somebody could ride a bike for five hours every day to kneel in front of his wife's grave. Imagine feeling that way about your spouse, about your children, about the kids that you, to the kids that you coach. He still remains as one of my greatest coaches because I still go see him. Every time I come out for a game in the fall, except I bring 16 guys with me. We always go see Newt Rockney's grave. He showed me the real grave, Harry did, not the tourist grave. And then I go see Harry, and I tell the story about the impact he had on my life and try to mentor some of the younger kids that this is what I do. I show respect to him for the lessons he gave me, and maybe someday you do the same for the people that showed respect to you. I shared my experience of running the stadium steps now, I couldn't run one more step, but as soon as I saw someone there, I could have run for days. I told her that God was showing me that the beauty of sport is the man who runs the stadium steps when the seats are empty. Anybody can run them when they're full. And so it's really the journey and the process of trying to become the best you can possibly be, but which is the real story, not the success of being a great player. You know, years later, I appreciate all the heartbreak. And I actually really appreciate the feelings that I had when I questioned God and asked why I deserved more and why wasn't I given that. It wasn't about me. It was never about me. It was about him. And through all these lessons, I, knew, I, I learned a new perspective on athletics and life. And I realize now that it was never the plan for me to be great. The plan was for me to learn lessons that I could teach other kids to become great. They were supposed to be great, not me. And I really, truly appreciate that. And I have a clear vision now that God's plan has worked because I've been able to inspire and instill things in a lot of kids through coaching at my camps, through CYO, youth basketball, high school, and collegiate coaching. And I'll tell you that those building blocks, joy, compassion, Respect, enlightenment, love, balance, they're all part of what went in to being successful at the levels I did. Several years ago, I got a chance to go to Beijing, China. And I was doing some basketball clinics over there. And I was asked by a reporter, what's the most important skill in basketball? And I said, love. And she said, no, no, I mean basketball skill. I said, yeah, love. He said, I know, dribbling, passing, shooting, rebounding. Which one would you say? I said, love. That's the key element here because it really comes down to what are you willing to do for your friends? You know, are you willing to get a backside rebound? It's funny. I was listening to coaches up here earlier, you know, and a lot of us know the words. We know what's right, but the great coaches live it, and they implement it, and they get kids to believe in it. I think you really have to coach attitude today because kids are not getting it anymore. They used to go to church, and they got great lessons. They listened to the gospel. They listened to the homilies. They don't do that anymore. They got it in the schools. They got moral development. Can't do that anymore. They got it on television. They watched great movies and great TV shows. Every show I watched had a moral lesson at the end. Ricky Nelson lost his socks, and they found them, and there was some sort of a lesson to it. You know, and, and today there's no lessons. We see kids being mean to each other and bullying people, and we think that's the norm. We think it's okay to go out and do things that aren't the Christian way to act. So where's that going to come from? That's got to come from us. 
It's got to come from us. And you got to commit to it. I used attitude cards. I passed out an attitude card every day. And on that card was a quote. So every day we'd circle up. I'd give every kid a card. One of them would read it. We'd talk about what the quote meant. And I have kids today who still have those quotes. The other day I ran into John MacArthur, a great young player for me. He was player of the year in Northern California. He went to Santa Clara, great player, had a chance to go play professional, called me on the phone, said, Coach, I'm done. I said, really, John, you don't want to play anymore? He goes, no, it's time to take all the lessons you taught me and use them in life. That's what this is about. And I told him, I'm so proud of you for hearing you say that. John's killing it in the business world. And I saw him, and he, he sent me a picture of his closet. He had about 100 cards that I had given him on a staple to his closet wall. But he said, the one I like the most, I look at it every morning before I go on a sales call. It says, on the shores of hesitation lie the countless millions of bleached bones who at the dawn of victory stopped to rest, and in resting they perished. And I just thought it was so amazing that he had that one thing that speaks to his core. And I think you've got to do that with children today. You have to give them motivational cards if you find something. If I saw a good story on Michael Jordan, I, I'd give it to them. You know, we had chapel services once a week. And they were the most profound things I was ever involved in. And our kids would be around a circle, and we had a candle in the middle. And each kid would go around and, and say something about their opponent or what they were going to do tonight. And it was a very moving thing. Sometimes they'd bring a film clip in. You know, we'd bring something in from Gladiator or Braveheart or something. And we were molding these minds to think about good stuff and to think about the competition really wasn't about beating their team. It was about loving each other best we could. When I changed careers here, and my coaching career took a drastic turn. I took a job at the uh, University of San Francisco as the associate head coach because the coach there said he was going to go to the NBA and it would be a good opportunity for me and I probably could get the job. And I thought, this is something I'd like to try. So I went over there as the associate head coach, and it didn't turn out that way because he was let go. And very rarely did they hire someone from the fired staff. So I was kind of in limbo. And the athletic director called me and he said, I want you to try something different. He said, come over to the administrative side. You know, be the senior executive associate athletic director. And I said, I don't even know what that means, A. And B, I'm not qualified to do that. And I have no idea what to do. He said, just follow me around for a year. You'll figure it out. I didn't know what to do. So I called my good friend, Bob Latticer, who was the head coach at La Salle, legendary football coach. And I called Bob on the phone and I said, Bob, I got this opportunity. He goes, are you nuts? This is a great opportunity for you. And I said, but I still want to coach. And he said, Frank, coaching to you was never about winning and losing. It was spreading the gospel. Why would you spread the gospel to 15 kids when you could take that job and spread the word to 250 athletes, all of the coaches, get involved in the community of San Francisco and touch thousands more lives if that's what you really believe you do, because that's what I believe you do. And I did it. I decided to do it. And he's been right. That's what it's been. I feel more gratified than ever because I'm getting involved in the city of San Francisco and, and working with underserved kids, ability to go to classes and, and talk to kids that I wouldn't be able to do if I were coaching. And I urge all of you here that are administrators to think beyond your school. You know, think into the community. Think of other ways that you can spread the word. Most of us are here today because someone inspired us. And we have that desire to keep that alive, right? I always tell my high school coach, I've never called him. He always tells me to call him Don. I said, no, you're, you're Mr. You know, you're my coach, you know? And, and I always tell him, I said, I'm trying to give you immortality because they spread the word of you through, through me, you know, to others. And I think about the blessing that I had in my life to have Coach Parsegan, who I think was the ultimate coach that everyone should aspire to. I went to his funeral two summers ago, and as I was thinking about my loss, because I dearly loved him, I thought about the night when my father called me. We were in our usual weekly Sunday night call. My dad called me, and we're talking, and he said, you have to watch 60 Minutes tonight. There's a profile on your coach. I said, what do you do? He said, just watch it. Three hour time difference. So three hours later, I turn on 60 minutes and Coach Parsegan's on there and he's talking about his grandchildren. That one of his grandchildren was playing in the playground and his coordination was off. He kept falling down. He couldn't do things other kids were doing. 
and the school sent the word home that you better get him checked. There's something going on. They took him to his family doctor who said he was just clumsy. He was just struggling. But when they were doing an eye check with an ophthalmologist, they noticed something was wrong. And they sent him to Columbia University to be tested. And within five minutes, they said, you have neiman pick c syndrome. It's a neurological disease where your body doesn't process cholesterol. It overtakes all the functions of your organs. It's an awful death. It's incurable. And it affects your legs, your limbs. You can't move. It eventually suffocates you. And Coach Parsegan got the word that his grandson had this. To further complicate it, they said it's a genetic disease, so you must test all of your grandchildren. He had four grandchildren. Three of them have it. So imagine being a grandparent and getting that news. But what Coach's response was, was to go around the country, he started the Arab Parsegan Medical Foundation. There were two researchers researching this disease. Only 500 kids have it. Two researchers in the world researching this. And Coach gets involved. He starts doing fundraisers all over the country, golf events, speaking engagements. And I got to go to one of them. And I went to the one in Berkeley, California. And it was unreal. I walked in, and there he was, just me and him. And he said to me, where are you sitting? And I said, nowhere. He goes, come sit with me. I got 15 minutes alone with him. I swear to you, I treasure it to this day, those 15 precious minutes, just me and him. And he said, Frank, your 89% winning percentage at Concord Dealer Cell is quite impressive. I said, well, it's not as good as yours was, but I'm trying to keep up with you. you know, and, and, and he would talk about winning and losing, and he never would, he always talked about the little details. I'll never, I'll never forget that. He was talking about how people will watch a, a, a quarterback throw an interception and think that cost them the game. Or the fullback fumbled that cost you the game. He said, no, you lost the game when your right guard split was off by an inch, which caused the tackle to be off two and the tight end to be off four. And now things that should have broken aren't breaking. It's the little things. And he was teaching me this as we're sitting there. And then he starts to tell me about his grandchildren. And he said, Frank, I can't save my kids. But I dedicate my life that no parent, no grandparent will ever go through what we're going through. I said, Kind of like adversity has the effect of eliciting talents which under prosperous conditions might have remained dormant. He lit up. I taught somebody something. And I said, Coach, if you ever knew, anything I ever am, I owe to that man. And the lessons he lived. You know, when he passed away, or prior to his passing away, he asked people not to come see him. He said, send me a letter if you'd like. And so a lot of us wrote him letters. And I wrote him a letter, and I have to be honest with you, I'm a little bit selfish. And what I thought about was, did he get my letter? It always bothered me. I never knew because he died shortly after I sent my letter. And then I got a call when Notre Dame was playing Miami of Ohio. And it was a guy from ESPN. He was doing a story on the cradle of coaches, which Ara was a part of, and featuring Ara. And he said he called Mrs. Parsegan. And he said, what were Ara's last days like? She said, he got a lot of letters from former players. And he got, is there any that stood out? And she said, yeah, he got one from Frank Alaco. And so this guy calls me. And he tells me that story. And I was like, oh, he got my letter. And he said, do you mind if we publish it? And I said, well, read it to me. Tell me what I said. And what I said was, dear coach, as always, your team looks to you for lessons in dealing with adversity. You continue to be the role model of how a man should live his life. We are all blessed to have been sons of Notre Dame, raised by Coach Parsegan, an amazing father. Little did we know the importance and significance of the decision your sons made as 18-year-old boys to believe and trust in you. And you never let us down through success and adversity as you have been the guiding light of our lives as we live the lessons we learned from amazing mentor. I will be eternally grateful. Think of how amazing it would be if we had that balance. If we had that balance, if we could be that kind of coach. For true greatness as a coach is not just saying words, anybody can say the words, but to live the words and model it to the kids, that's most impressionable. Because coaches are extensions of their teams, of their coaches' personality. On Thursday, I was blessed to attend the opening prayer of our retreat in front of the Hesburgh Library. I've stood in front of that mural a thousand times, but I never knew the meaning of it until Kristen shared it with us. And she talked about Jesus' arms outraised and how 
the mural is inclusive. 81 different stones from 16 countries, Jesus standing in the center with generations of saints and teachers underneath him, all flowing down beneath his outstretched arms. Each of those were coaches educating the next generation. And as I listened to her words, I looked up at the word of life and realized that that's a living, breathing mural. And as we are standing below it, we're part of that picture. We are the next level that flows below Jesus. We are the next generation that teaches and inspire others. And I hope you will leave here today challenged to teach the lessons to the boys and girls who look up reverently calling us coach. I have always believed there's no coincidences in life. All the people, all the events of our lives are there because you have drawn them there. As Jim said this morning, you are exactly where you are supposed to be. All of us were called here today for a reason. We've heard many wonderful speakers who have called us to serve, mentor, and model for others. Pope Paul VI once said, it's the responsibility of the laity to proclaim the gospel of Christ. It's our words, it's our actions, like the great thinkers on the Word of Life mural that will be remembered as they live in the hearts and souls of the next generations. I thank all of you for your time, and I challenge you to leave here committed to live the lessons we learn as we change the world one player at a time. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you.